are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna, but today's case is about the Bloody Benders. They are thought to be America's first serial killer family, and unfortunately, it was never solved. Their case has never been fully shut because we may have known who they were, but not where they had gone. By the way, I want to add in a quick announcement right here that I have come out with merch for you all. I know you guys have been asking for it, so I came out with a few pieces to start us off. If you would rather just have something very generic that has to do with true crime, whether you want something that's very much a part of our community or kind of a mixture of both, we have three different pieces on the website right now. I will leave it in the description down below if you would like to get any and support me further. All the money from that will be going straight back into this channel to make it the best I can possibly make it. So if you do want it, I would be so greatly appreciative of it and I cannot wait to be twinning with you. And I really, really hope you guys like it because I have designed these all myself and put so much time and effort into them. Also, make sure you are subscribed because I post so much content like this and your support truly does mean everything and keeps me going. So let's get back to the story. So it was the 1870s and much of the land that would eventually become Cherryville, Kansas was not being settled on after the government had moved the Osage Indians out of the area into the Indian Territory southwest of this area in Labette County. When families began moving to this area, they were very hardworking and doing everything that they could to survive in the harsh weathers of Kansas and the difficult it could bring, but they were also very accepting of newcomers in the area. And so when five new families decided to move in that were spiritualists or people who like to communicate with the dead, they were very open-minded to this. They had no judgment and they accepted them wholeheartedly. Like I said, this religion was super, super new to the people who were already living there, but they asked very few questions. And so these five families moved in and began to live how everybody else was. A few months into it is when two of those families decided to move away because this harsh winds and the heat were making farming nearly impossible and they couldn't handle it anymore. So they decided to head out. But the Bender family was among those who stayed because you see, the farming wasn't the only thing they cared about. In fact, it wasn't even their number one priority. Although even though I can tell you this now, the people who lived around them did not know of their true intentions back then just yet. The Bender family appeared to be a very normal family as many families who, or many people in general who do these dark things, are said to be very normal. And this family consisted of Pa, who was John Bender, Ma, who was Elvira Bender, and their two children, John Jr. and Kate. John Jr. was also sometimes called Thomas, and so John Jr. and John both went out along the Osage Trail to find their own housing. The boys of the family went to see where they were going to settle and build their house. And so they found an 160 acre land on the northeast side of Labette County and they decided to put the offer in to claim that land. And also while they were there, John Jr. decided to purchase a piece, a small piece of adjoining land right next to Paws. And they also bought rocks from their neighbor as well as a slab that was seven feet square, three inches thick. And this was to be the floor of the cellar. They ended up creating a 24 by 16 inch cabin on this very land. They also dug two wells in the area for their water supply. But interestingly enough, when they got the whole cabin built on the inside, it was only one big room. But this one big room was separated by a large curtain down the center. And this was because the Bender family decided they wanted a public inn and a store in their cabin and they decided to have the front half be that place and the back half be their actual living quarters. Outside, Ma and Kate created an orchard which had fruit trees and plants galore and they really worked together on that. And Kate and her brother John Jr., they spoke fluent English, whereas Ma and Pa spoke 
what was believed to be German. Now an interesting fact about Kate was that she was said to be a spiritualist medium or healer in the family. The Prairie Bender store, what they would eventually call it, was only around a hundred yards away from this Osage Trail so this was perfect for travelers coming by to have as a rest stop and this was in 1871 and many travelers would come by and stop right there because it was almost the perfect opportunity to restock and rest. They could get things such as liquor, tobacco, horse feed, gunpowder, or food. And the benders would even offer them a place to stay overnight. Most of them who traveled alone would end up staying the night here, especially after hearing that this Kate had psychic abilities and could possibly help them heal anything they wanted. And they were intrigued and she had a very outgoing persuasive personality. So they would come into this house and they would stay the night. But when people started going missing from this area, many really didn't think much of it. Not because people didn't care what was happening, but because it happened so often that they expected it. These travelers knew the risk and the repercussions of going out, especially on their own. They could run into bandits, diseases, anything possible that could leave them right there on the trail, unable to go home to their families. And the fact that news traveled so slowly at this time really hindered everything because if people were hearing about something, they wouldn't hear about the next accident or the next person going missing for quite a long time, meaning that they didn't see it as as urgent as it was. But eventually people began to be weary of Labette County and everything that was going on there. This led to a meeting in 1873 from 75 individuals of the surrounding areas coming together at the Harmony Grove Schoolhouse to discuss what was happening, what they could do to prevent it, and just what in the world was going on. And to be quite honest with you, I'm not sure this meeting would have even happened if people would have even cared if it wasn't for a very well-known physician going missing in this very area. You see, in March of 1873, a Dr. William York had traveled to Labette County. He had taken a train from Independence and ended in Cherryville. Got off this train and went missing. And normally, like I said, nobody really thought much of it and would have just left it alone if it wasn't for who Dr. York was and who his brothers were as well. You see, one brother was a Colonel Edward York and the other was Kansas Senator Alexander York. And they were determined to find out what in the world happened to their brother. And so after this meeting that they had, they began to question people in the area to see if they knew where Dr. William York had gone. And among those people questioned were the Benders, and specifically Ma Bender. And they had questioned her, and at first she said she didn't know what had happened to this Dr. York. She'd never heard of him. But then they brought up a report that had been made against the Benders, saying that this woman had stayed there and been threatened with knives and pistols. And to this, Ma turned to a violent rage of passion, saying that this woman was a witch, a bad and wicked woman who, if she had ever come near them again, would be killed. Now, at this meeting that we were talking about, everyone had agreed to do full searches of all of the properties in the area, but when the weather got bad, the searches ceased and everyone kind of went home to be in safe environments and decided to wait it out, which would end up being for three days. This time would have been the most valuable in their case, but unfortunately, they lost it. And around the time the searches were set to begin again, a neighbor of the Benders were driving his cows past their inn when he saw some starved animals kind of rummaging around the yard, walking aimlessly, and it was strange for that Bender household for them to be doing that. When he pulled up, he noticed that nobody was home. Their wagon was also gone as well as food and clothing, and when the investigators were asked to come by and they went inside to search, they noticed that the area, the house was not in disarray, but it did have an overwhelming stench that they couldn't get over. And that is when they found the trap door hidden behind the curtain. When investigators went to pry it open with its leather hinges, they opened it up to find a private cellar underneath. 
even worse, it was covered in clotted blood. They believed they had found their dumping ground where possibly Dr. York had been hidden. So they went to the extremes and completely dug up this cabin and moved it over so they could dig underneath this house. Unfortunately though, they dug and they dug and they found nothing but blood. They were about to give up when Dr. York's brother himself noticed something strange and decided to have them search a different place. And that is when they found Dr. York's body in the orchard. This orchard was very freshly plowed and the neighbors said that it was always like that. Throughout the night, they eventually came across Dr. York's body that was head first buried into the ground and his head had been bludgeoned with a hammer and his throat had been slit. And unfortunately, the bodies didn't stop there. It was said that they found at least a dozen and that there were possibly up to 21 people murdered by the Bender family. There was actually a young girl found in a grave with her father who had appeared to be buried alive. These bodies had been stripped of belongings and clothing, and after these bodies were found, investigators began trying to retrace the steps that led up to these individuals' deaths. The MO that the investigators believed was the correct one was that the benders would invite these travelers in, or just guests in general, to their inn, and they would go and have dinner with them. And during this dinner, they would ask them to sit with their back to the curtain. At this point, someone from behind the curtain would smash their head, cut their throat, and then drag them to this trap door where they would take all of their belongings and hold them until they could bury them outside. Many bullet holes were found in the wall directly across from where this curtain was, as well as the ceiling, as though some of the victims had tried to fight back when they had been hit in the head. And then by the time they were fighting back, the women were coming forward with the knives and ended the job there and ended their chance of fighting back. After hearing all of this and seeing that there was a reward posted for $1,000 from Dr. York's brothers in regards to finding the benders and information about them, a man named Mr. Wetzel came forward and he said he had a very eerie recollection of the Bender family and being at that inn and he said that when he went there they had offered him dinner and told him to sit in a certain place right in front of that very curtain. He refused to sit there and Ma got very angry and abusive towards him. And at this point, both of the Bender males came out from behind the curtain to eat with them. And at this, Mr. Wetzel got a very strange feeling and actually left the entire inn. After this, another man named William Pickerman came forward with almost the same exact story saying that that almost happened to him as well. In May, the governor offered a $2,000 reward, but still no one ever tried to even claim it. Although now everyone everywhere heard of the benders through the newspapers and they knew who they were and also of the land that they lived on that was now being referred to as Hell's Acre. Over the years, several women were ruled out as being Ma or Kate and several vigilante groups had come forward claiming they had killed the entire Bender family, but no one ever had proof that they had done this. A train conductor identified the Bender family as the family who had bought tickets to Humboldt, but the kids actually ended up getting off at Chanute and heading for Texas, while the parents got off at Kansas City and headed for St. Louis. But that cannot be confirmed either. Investigators found that the Benders weren't actually the Benders at all, and in fact, the only two that were actually possibly related were Ma and Kate. Ma's real name was Almira Meek, and her first husband had been George Griffin, whom she had had 12 kids with, one being Kate Griffin. Ma had been married several times, and it was 
thought that all of her husbands had died of head wounds. Pa's real name was found to be John Flickinger, who was born in either Germany or the Netherlands, and John Jr. was found to be John Jebhart. Even more strange was that the two that everyone believed to be siblings, Kate and John Jr., were actually thought to be husband and wife. Many who knew them from back in Kansas said that they were actually married not siblings at all. Then a rumor went around in around 1884 that Pa had committed suicide in Lake Michigan. Strangely enough, the same year, a man who looked a lot like Pa had been arrested in Michigan for murder with a hammer. These investigators in Michigan contacted the ones in Cherryvale to see if they would come and help identify Pa and see if this really was the man that was the Paul Bender and who had done all of these murders back in Cherryvale. But by the time these people from Cherryvale, Kansas got to Michigan, Pa had cut his foot off trying to escape, bled out, and was now decaying on the floor. He was decomposing so badly that they couldn't even do the identification process. The benders were never officially caught and this case was never solved. And an 80 year old man now lives on the land that they had apparently murdered so many people on and says that he is the first to live there since the benders. However, the cabin that they lived in was taken piece by piece apart by people who wanted souvenirs and so it no longer stands today. But do you think that the benders went on to kill more in different places? Do you think that this family separated? Do you think that Pa was really this man who murdered in Michigan so many years later? I think that if they killed so many people just to get the small, insignificant funds that these people had on them or belongings that they had, then they would definitely kill to survive once again. However, I don't think that they stayed together and I think ultimately that's how they got away with it. I'm pretty sure that the two siblings actually were married and Ma and Pa maybe were as well and maybe they went their separate ways and Ma and Kate said goodbye as mother and daughter and separated for probably the rest of their lives in order to not be caught because it's much easier to spot four people and say, oh my gosh, that's the benders, than two. I do believe they probably did kill. Once again, for survival, for fun, I'm not really sure. It seems to be more about survival, but they also did it so often that maybe it did turn into a little bit of sick fun to them. Do you think that Pa was this guy who was arrested? I think if he knew that this identification process was coming and he knew he could get far more punishment than just of this one murder he already had been caught doing, that would be a good reason to have taken his life before they could identify him as Paul Bender. Or if it was just a very strange coincidence, who knows? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this one down below. I wanted to do a little bit older of a case because I am talking about my merch that I just came out with. I didn't. I never want to be disrespectful to the victims by, you know, talking too much about me. Again, if you want to get any merch and kind of join our community by having an actual, like, material item to show off and show your support, then I would love to see that. And if you want to send me pictures, whether it's on Instagram or Twitter, I'm just at Brooke McKenna with a little underscore. But don't ever forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye.